say what you want about us gamers, and many people have, but we do like to make life far more complicated than it needed to be, all in the name of entertaining ourselves. Whether you've sat for 20 consecutive hours completing a game just so you can discuss it online without spoilers, or grinded through as many platinum trophies as possible before your body took over to physically drag you outside. At one time or another, we've all set ourselves some kind of self-imposed video game challenge. It's not necessarily to qualify on a scoreboard or to be patted on the back by a proud yet highly concerned esports official, but rather for our own sense of accomplishment. These challenges are usually pointless, often unrecognised, and far more fun than they have any right to be. With so many different types of games out there, ranging in genre, hardware and play style, these challenges can vary from playing Metal Gear inside a cardboard box, to programming any machine possible to run Doom. We ourselves are certainly not free from making spectacles of ourselves online, we have based an entire show on the concept, so you can bet we're going to be taking notes. I'm Ashton from Triple Jump, and here are 10 ways fans make video games more difficult for themselves. Number 10. Speedruns while self-explanatory, we felt it important to include speedrunning on this list, because it was the challenge that launched a thousand ships, and by ships we mean a thousand more infinitely complicated challenges. Speedrunning has existed since before the internet was even invented. Back in the day, you had no newfangled forums, you had to photograph your computer screen with a Polaroid and post it to a video game newsletter to be listed in the next edition. However, in 1993, Christina Norman set up the LPM Hall of Fame website to post demo files of Doom speedruns, leading to many more websites dedicated to showing off how good people were at Doom, Quake, Metroid and so on. Today you can speedrun pretty much any game possible and boast about your accomplishments online. While it started off as simply seeing how fast you could go, the space is now so competitive that modern speedrunners rely on intense strategies, glitch manipulation and hours upon hours of practice to shave off milliseconds of time. It's not as easy as it once was, but at least you save money on postage. Number 9. No Damage Runs No damage runs are relatively simple to explain, but that doesn't mean that they are in any way easy. While taking damage in a game like Everybody's Gone to the Rapture would be an achievement in itself, being literally a walk in the park, it is certainly trickier to do in games where the very goal is to battle everything you run into. Open world games are often favourite go-tos, thanks to their gameplay allowing you to avoid most of the optional enemies and going straight to the final boss. But in doing so, you do not pass go and you do not collect $200. Games like Super Smash Bros Melee and Bloodborne on the other hand, I... I don't even know how that works. While Soulsborne games are technically open world, the world is so inherently violent, and everything is constantly throwing themselves at you to inflict damage. Super Smash Bros at least has the kindness to give you an achievement for completing a level without attacking or taking damage, again quite a feat in a game revolving around punching each other in the face. Like most challenges, no damage runs are probably more practical to do in real life, like when you're driving a car or crossing a busy road. Please do try to perfect that particular no damage run. It really is worth it. Number 8. Blindfolded Runs Similar in popularity to no damage runs, blindfolded runs are a real celebration of our brain's ability to visualise not only our actual surroundings, but our surroundings in a completely virtual space. Certain games are purposefully restrictive, like Mike Tyson's Punch Out, which keeps you contained within the boxing ring. And Guitar Hero's blindfolded runs are similar to how a skilled guitarist can play a song without having to look at their hands. These things are tricky, but doable with enough skill and practice. However, for open world games, I don't even begin to grasp how you don't immediately get lost. It would be like blindfolding me in London Waterloo Station and telling me to find my way to the National Gallery. I'd end up either floating in the Thames or somehow finding myself in Kettering. As if that weren't already difficult, it isn't enough to just play blindfolded, these players are often also speedrunning the game. Because why bother memorising the journey from Waterloo to the National Gallery if you aren't sprinting at top speed all the way there? Number 7. Weird Controllers as with the aforementioned Doom hacks, it has become a challenge for anyone with any basic grasp of electrical engineering or coding to rig up the most ridiculous possible item to play a video game with, and then complete a game using it. The Sega Fishing Rod controller, with its authentic fishing rod design, was originally made for Sega bass fishing. However, along with its Xbox 360 counterpart, it has entered a new life of being a favourite amongst fans looking to overcomplicate their gaming sessions, not to be outdone by something that, while fishing rod shaped, still still has standard control features, people have managed to play games with musical instruments as well. Not just the Guitar Hero controllers, actual built for making music keyboards. Then for good measure, I'm sure some of them decided to speedrun it while blindfolded. The show-offs.
Number six, low score runs. No matter how bad you are at video games, it is almost impossible to not score at least a few points, especially in games where they're literally lying around all over the place. In fact, it is so difficult to score nothing at all that, well, people have turned that into a challenge too. One of the games that seemingly gives you points just for breathing in and out is Super Mario Bros. It and its sequels have become common targets in these runs, just to see how few points players can rack up before the end credits. Avoiding killing any enemies, neglecting to break blocks, and dodging around loose coins is only half the challenge for our favourite plumber. With both the end flagpole and the time left on your clock giving you points when you finish, you have to faff around until you're literally out of time, grabbing the flagpole exactly as the time a display zero. But because Mario is too nice for its own good, even then it will award you with 100 points for trying your best, with each world able to be completed with a minimum of 500 points. It's an interesting way of breathing new life into old favourites, even if I can't abide the idea of not picking up the shiny things. It goes against my very nature. Number 5. Carrying an object a lot of young children like to carry around a favourite toy, blanket or other comfort item wherever they go. And while sometimes that carries over into adulthood, we're not here to judge, as an adult you're usually more focused on getting to work on time and remembering not to lock yourself out of the house. When it comes to playing games though, that weird instinct has a habit of creeping back in bizarre fashion, carrying a single object throughout an entire game. While sometimes you can place an item in your inventory and let it come along for the ride, it is harder when that thing isn't allowed in your inventory at all. You need to juggle it along with various weapons and other important items you have to carry on your way. Spelunky is infamously challenging on its own, but if you manage to carry an eggplant through to the final boss, possible only through a glitch, it will then change the final boss into an aubergine monster who dies in one hit. Half-Life Alex encourages bold players to bring Noam Chomsky with them, awarding them a special achievement at the end if they manage not to leave him behind. Thankfully he's not as fragile as real garden gnomes, otherwise it'll be over in minutes. <laughs> Number 4. The Nuzlocke Challenge with eight generations and more than 20 games, Pokemon is a colossus of a series spanning decades, mechanics, and playstyles. Naturally, many challenges have sprouted from it. However, the Nuzlocke challenge stands out as one of the most famous. Named for a Nuzleaf that was itself jokingly named after the lost character John Locke, how's that for a deep cut? The Nuzlocke challenge limits the players to using only the first Pokemon captured in a given area. If that Pokemon faints, it is then considered dead and it must be released. You get no second second chances, heals, or revives. I'd hate to be the child that leaves town after you though, just following the trail of unconscious level 4 Pokemon you've littered in your wake. The extra cruel rule is that every Pokemon captured must be nicknamed. As the eminent Mike Wazowski once said, once you name it, you start getting attached to it. So the moment your beloved Wallace the Bidoof gets KO'd by a Pidgey, you feel extra sad. I'll never forget you Wallace. Never. Number 3. Pacifist Runs when a game is designed explicitly around killing, refraining from killing seems like it should be impossible. But some people have still managed to do it, through hell or high water. A pacifist run, as anyone even passingly familiar with Undertale will know, involves completing a game without harming anyone, even at personal risk to yourself. For games built with this in mind, the game and its characters can react and change around you, depending on your decisions. For other games though, it is purely for the benefit of your own sense of moral superiority. Skyrim-like open world games are somewhat easier to complete like this, as there are often non-violent solutions to conflict. However, Metal Gear Solid, Doom and Hitman, all games in which you'd assume killing is mandatory, have been completed with zero kills, albeit with some notable caveats. Then again, I don't know how long Agent 47 will stay in employment with this new attitude. Number 2. Crimeless Challenge Outside of Pokemon's Nuzlocke challenge, all of our previous entries are able to be done in a variety of games. However, a crimeless challenge only really applies to games that revolve around committing crimes, and that's mainly the Grand Theft Auto series. Spanning 16 games, Grand Theft Auto fans have scoured for ways to complete some kind of crimeless challenge, and for the vast majority of titles, it is sadly impossible. The characters regularly commit mass murder, deal drugs in Vice City, run criminal gangs in Lost and Damned, and in San Andreas you… <gasps> 
steal a bike? Accounting for all the crimes required of you to complete the games in a series literally named after a crime, the only one that really allows for a crimeless challenge is Grand Theft Auto 4. And even then, you have to stretch some definitions and turn a blind eye to a few misdemeanors. With a full walkthrough of the challenge available online, crimelessness mainly counts as a lack of murders and major incidents, but it does require certain things to be done in order to progress. So you will need to steal a minimum of four boats and one helicopter, and blow up another helicopter. But come on, who hasn't done that at least some point in their lives? And number one, playing two games at once. Are you ever in that mood where you can't choose between playing one game or another because both of them are just so good and you can't make up your mind as to which one you'd prefer? Well then, why not play them both? And I don't mean play one for a bit and then the other for a bit, like a sensible person. I mean, hook up two monitors, two consoles and two controllers, or one controller if you want to get serious about this, and see if your ability to multitask holds up. You may remember when we tried to play Fortnite whilst also making a sandwich. It's much like that, only with less food waste. The games chosen are often similar in playstyle, or different games in the same series. For instance, playing Mike Tyson's Punch-Out at the same time as playing Super Punch 2, Metroid Fusion and Metroid Zero Mission, or Shenmue 1 and 2. This is so things don't get too overcomplicated by playing, say, a 3D RPG and a 2D puzzle game at once, though people certainly have tried. These multitasking challenges are often also speedruns, because if this video has taught us one thing, it's that gamers never do things by halves, and we salute every single last one of them.